Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, wow. What do we know about decision making in three and a half minutes? Ready? Go. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to be here. And they didn't tell me it was going to be such a good looking audience as well. This is fantastic. Um, I'd like to start with a quotation here. And this is quite interesting because we deal in an industry of communications and marketing and advertising with trends. And it's very trendy to talk about trends. And I'd like to start off by challenging that, by saying that actually we are in the business of behaviour change. And the, what the behaviour you have to change is to get people to donate their time or their money. And they have to do that in the first place. Then they have to choose how much they donate, how frequently they donate, and to which cause, because there are competitors in the room. And the analogy with the commercial world is, is pretty perfect. That's from where, where I come from. And it's trendy to talk about change, but actually at the heart of behaviour change lies something unchanging. And I'd like to start with this quotation. This was written by an advertising man, Bill Birnbeck, in the 60s, and it's as true today as it was then. It took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. It will take millions more for them to even vary. It's fashionable to talk about changing man. A communicator must be concerned with unchanging man with his obsessive drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his own. And this is what we're going to focus on. Now, I didn't get into the commercial world for the love of science. I'm not a scientist. But what I found by looking at the uh, fields of what we call decision science, and by that I mean behavioural economics, neuroscience, cognitive psychology and social psychology, is that science knows more about behaviour change and why we do what we do than the commercial world ever uses or even knows about. And when I first started in this field, I would say to the guys who are now my colleagues, how do you know that? And they'd look at me and say, but Phil, how come you don't know that? Because we're talking about a study that was done 10 years ago, or this is a paradigm that everybody knows in, in psychology. And the penny dropped. And the work we did together, based around decision science and changing behaviour, was really quite successful. We really launched the T-Mobile brand. And you may remember this ad in the UK about four years ago, the Liverpool Street Station flash mob dance ad. That one ad is the single most successful ad in the history of UK telecoms market. It grew sales by 49%. It halved acquisition cost. And it's pretty done pretty well on social media. That's three times the number of views of a John Lewis Christmas ad. It's done pretty well. So this stuff works. It's not just theory. And I'd like to introduce you to some of the key principles here. Now, the first thing is what drives a decision. In this study, it was about purchasing products and services. This was a study done at Stanford University. And what they did was put people into brain scanners, show them images of different products and brands and services for four seconds. Then they showed them the price. Then the respondents were given a task. Will I buy that brand for that price? And I've just taken one example, which is Godiva chocolates. And the scientists wanted to observe what happens in the brain at each of those points in time. And so they measured what happened. And this is interesting because when people see the brand or the product or the service, the so-called reward center in the brain is activated. Now, this is significant because the scientists already knew that this part of the brain is activated when we see something we value very highly. Even a mother seeing an image of her children will activate the reward center. They also knew that when this center is activated, there is a very high probability that action will follow. So this was interesting in and of itself. Now, when people were shown the price, something very different happened. The pain centre in the brain was triggered. <laughs> Seriously, the same part of the brain that's triggered if you cut yourself or fall over. So metaphorically, the brain is saying, that's pleasurable, that's rewarding, I value it highly, I want it, but ouch, it hurts me, it pains me to give away money to acquire the reward. And then what happened was a trade-off. And if the reward was sufficient to overcome the pain of the price, the person pressed yes. And if it wasn't, they pressed no. And the scientists could predict, just by observing the brain activity, which button they were going to press before they pressed it. And so the simple neurologic of a decision is based on this thing called net value. If the result of the reward minus the pain is positive, we will buy, we will act. And if it's not 
we won't. So in terms of the commercial world and your sector, it gives us two very powerful levers to pull. A reward lever, and we'll talk more about what rewards are, and a pain lever. We can increase the reward and or we can reduce the pain of the price. And that includes behavioural costs, by the way. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, this is just like economic value and cost, really. There's cost on one side and value on the other. So let's try a little experiment. Here you can see two price reductions, which objectively are identical. Eight pounds down to 5.99. And I'm going to ask you, if you had to take the decision, which of these you think would sell more, which one you would choose? Now, they're objectively identical, so the economic value and cost is the same but I'm going to tell you that one sold more. So please put up your hands if you think the one on the right would sell more. And the one on the left? Okay, slight preference for the one on the left. That's, that's pretty normal. Whenever I showed this to a retail marketing conference and the room was split 50-50 and you've all got cogent reasons to support your choice. Now science tells us there are three principles that support the one on the right, size congruence, the way the brain processes numbers, a principle known as anchoring, and also what we've just seen with Godiva chocolates, the triggering of pain. And those three factors accounted for a significant difference in purchase consideration. 25% difference. Now, there's no difference in economic value and cost. And even if I take the paradigm that I grew up with, emotional and rational, how on earth do you explain this effect? You can't. There's nothing emotional or rational about it, yet it's real. And science knows why. And that's the point, that we can leverage learnings from science to help us understand. Here's another example. Now, again, I'm going to ask you to vote. This is not a trick question. There's no right or wrong answer in this. I would just like you to look at these two faces and please put up your hands if you prefer the face on the left and the face on the right. OK, now there is a majority voting for the face on the left. And you have demonstrated exactly what happened in the study. You've replicated the results perfectly. Now, I am going to creep you out. <laughs> it is official. I am going to explain the reason why you prefer the one on the left. And you will not accept it, because it's, it's a bit weird. But again, science has a perfect explanation. These faces are morphed. They are composites. Two-thirds of each face is, a, is the same stock model, and one-third of the face is morphed of somebody else. And the reason why you pick the one on the left is because a third of the face is that of Tiger Woods. And a third of the face in the one on the right is someone you've never seen before. And simply the fact that you unconsciously are familiar with Tiger Woods' features led your brain to prefer it because we like what we know. Now, that is not a conscious process. You may even have negative attitudes towards Tiger Woods, but it doesn't matter. The point is familiarity. And this, is, this is not, doesn't just hold true with Tiger Woods, by the way. This has been tried with many other different celebrities, and the effect holds true. We like what we know. So there's some really weird stuff going on in the brain. So how can we explain this? Well, the best knowledge we have today of human decision-making is courtesy of Professor Daniel Kahneman, who four years ago stood exactly here and talked about his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And that's the culmination of his life's work. He won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002 for his work on decision-making. And what Kahneman says is there are two systems of mental processes going on in our brain simultaneously, what he calls System 1 and System 2. They have very different characteristics. System 1 works like an autopilot. It's on 24-7. It gets on and does its job effortlessly, automatically, spontaneously, very, very quickly. So if I said to you now, what's two times two? You don't have to think of the answer. It just appears as if by magic in your heads. But if I said, what's 24.7 times 17.39? Unless you had a very misspent youth, the answer probably wouldn't appear in your head because you didn't learn it. It's not implicit. You then have to resort to the other system, system two, which acts like a pilot. It intervenes and overrides when necessary. It's slow in contrast, it's effortful, and it, takes, uh, uh, it has very limited bandwidth compared to the autopilot. The autopilot's processing data at about 11 million bits per second, whereas the pilot system two is working at 40 bits per second. And 40 bits per second, ladies and gentlemen, is not enough to get you out of the house in the morning. 
And that's exactly why the autopilot is so powerful. Now, I don't expect you just to take this at face value. I want you to experience this. I'm going to show you a series of words on the screen in different colours, and I'd like you to call out loud. This is going to liven us up on a Thursday morning. Call out loud as quickly and spontaneously as you can the colour of the word that you see on the screen. Just the colour. OK, are you ready? Let's go. Roger, Roger, where are you? Where did you get this bunch from? Oh, you're disappointing. You've proven to me you're normal human beings. So what you just experienced was the autopilot and the pilot in conflict. We coped very well with that task up to a certain point in time, and then a word appeared, a shape that your autopilot knew because we learned it implicitly. It's our mother tongue, and bang, we say blue. And then a pilot overrides. No, 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 it's a colour. And then we're on to the next one. And we can't process that at 40 bits per second, which is why we all start laughing. And if I carried on, believe me, everyone would just end up as a mess. So we resort to the autopilot so much in our everyday lives. That comes in, to, in terms of the things that, uh, that we learn about this sector or the commercial sector. We become experts. These patterns become part of our neural network of associations, and we become experts. Now, this has profound implications because, let me show you, this is an experiment uh, where people were put in brain scanners, uh, sorry, before they were put in brain scanners, they were asked to name their favourite brands in a number of different sectors. And also those other brands in the same sectors that they would consider buying. So the researchers knew the individual's stated favourite brand and their consideration set. Then they were put in the brain scanners and shown images of the brands that they'd nominated, and the task was choose a brand to buy. And these are the images of the same person faced with two different images of brands. So the brain scan on the right shows a little bit of activity. The brain scan on the left lit up like a Christmas tree, so-called hotspots, indicative of blood oxidation, which is in turn indicative of neurons firing. So when Decode first showed me this and said, Phil, you're a marketing VP, which is the brain's response to the person's favorite brand? I said, guys, I've got this. This is a no-brainer. <laughs> It's the one on the left, because it's a person's favourite. Of course it's going to light up in response. And guess what? It's not. Why not? Because the brain on the left is thinking. The brain on the right has seen its favourite and has decided, like that, on autopilot, back into idle mode, Far more important things to do than buy a brand, by the way, like survival. And the brain on the left is burning up to 40% of the body's energy, which is why when you've had a really tough day at the office, you know, thinking through complex issues, looking at data, analysing things, you feel physically drained. And this is exactly why the autopilot has developed, because we need, the brain needs to conserve energy for things like survival. So in the mode on the right... The brain's using less than 5% of the body's available energy. So guess which mode the brain prefers each and every time. So this is really important. It's important to learn how to work with this autopilot because it's dominant and it, it absolutely drives our behaviour. I'm going to introduce you to some principles that uh, the autopilot responds to. Now, thinking back to the Godiva net value equation, the first thing we're looking for is what's in it for me, a reward. Again, an unconscious process. And the autopilot responds to rewards that, firstly, are tangible. How can I make what I do more tangible? Now, here's a couple of examples of behaviour change. You know if you've ever been caught speeding in a car, about a month later, a photograph arrives on your doormat with a fine. Well, that's not going to change your behaviour when, when it's needed, which is when you're speeding. So this experiment you can see on the left was very, very successful, flashing up a smiley or a frowny face affects decision in that moment because the, the autopilot decodes that very quickly. We don't even need to see a number to see how fast we're going, just whether we're speeding or not. And that changes the behaviour. And it's tangible. It's there in the moment. The Lego example, you know, you've got a box of bricks. What the kid wants to know is, what, what am I going to build? So Lego introduced a virtual reality system where you could scan the barcode and see a 3D image made tangible of what was in the box. Highly rewarding for the autopilot. The next, next principle is immediacy. I want it now. 
Now, thinking about your donors setting up regular donations, it's a bit like what the example here that a bank did. They wanted to encourage saving. The behavioural costs involved, so the pain involved in this process, is I've got to do it. I've got to phone the bank or visit the branch or go online, and then I've got to decide how much. And if it's not regular and I only want to save on an ad hoc basis, how much and when and what's the trigger to do it? So what they did, very simply, was create an app that was always there, a big red button on your phone. It's tangible, it's immediate, I can do it now, and I could, I could donate, or in this case, I can click to save whatever amount I prescribed, $2, $5. They got people saving hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of this. So it's tangible and it's immediate. And the third principle is certainty. How certain is the reward? In this case, this was OPOW, getting people to change their behaviour in energy consumption, and they made the value certain by comparing you to your neighbours with a smiley face and also graphically. I don't know what a kilowatt hour is, but if I can see how well I'm doing versus my neighbourhood and the people who are energy efficient, it helps to change my behaviour. And they, they estimate the effects in energy consumption was equivalent to hiking the price by 20%. Another example of certainty like that is, get, is building in commitment. So, you know, what, whether it's Weight Watchers or working with a client who's looking at a, a dietary behaviour change, and they're using this type of app where when you group together a like-minded community, so a group of local fundraisers or local donors or whatever, you get commitment just because of the group effect. You know, this is how much we have to run this week or walk this week or save this week. How well is the group doing? And that spurs on the individual because there's a commitment effect in there. Now, contrast these principles <coughs> with uh, a plea which might be, we're building, houses, uh, sorry, we're building schools in Africa. Please donate. Well, that's kind of tangible because I know what a school looks like, but... How big's a school going to be? Is it sort of small or big? I don't... Actually, it's not very tangible. It's not immediate, because I don't know when you're building the school, when it's going to be delivered. And, and certainty, well, I don't know if, if it's really going to be done. And, and anyway, it's hundreds of thousands of miles away, and I can't relate to it. Contrast that with, we're building schools in Africa. Your donation buys a brick now. You know, I know what a brick looks like. It makes it tangible, it makes it immediate, and it makes it certain, because I know that my donation is going to buy that brick and not be absorbed by some amorphous mass. So there are, there are techniques that you can employ here. Another example of, of certainty is the power of default. Now, you may have seen this before. This is a famous case of organ donation. Whether you opt into a scheme or the default is you are opted in and you then need to opt out. There is a huge difference in organ donation not driven by morality or religion between these two sets of countries, but simply whether, in terms of organ donation, people opt in or opt out to the scheme. Another example from science that was fascinating, you may care to, uh, to think about if you've got regular donations. Now, this was a lovely experiment where people were um, buying car washes. So every time I go to the car wash, I get a stamp. When I bought eight car washes, I get a free car wash. And what they tried was two different collector cards. The one on the right, you can see, had ten places, but they pre-stamped two. So you still had to buy eight. So economic value and cost, identical. Emotional, rational, doesn't help us here. Was there an effect on sales? There was a massive effect on sales. And again, science gives us the answer. And the answer is this, that when I have those two stamps, the goal, the reward, is activated. I'm on my way. I've already started. I'm not starting from scratch. I already have something. And something called the endowment effect, which is that we value what we have more than things that we don't have, makes me somehow value those two stamps just because I've got them. It might sound trivial, and it might sound ridiculous when we look at it like this, but look at the sales effect. It absolutely works. This autopilot is, is dominant. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a framework that we use to, to work with the autopilot, and we're going to look at a couple of principles um, that we can use to, to employ. So the framework is this, what goes on in the autopilot? So everything you do in terms of communicating to your communities is on the left-hand side. It's like data, all these signals coming into the brain, advertising, 
direct mail, sponsorship, celebrities, whatever it might be, they're all data coming into the brain. And the autopilot deals with them broadly in three chunks. The first thing is attention and perception, the gateway into the brain. We have to get in through the five senses. The second block is cognition, where the brain turns those data into meaning. What is it? What does it represent? And we use associative memory to do that, to make sense of the incoming data. And then we get motivation. What's in it for me? Is it rewarding? Now, all of this happens in milliseconds, and it happens largely unconsciously. It's underpinned by associative memory and overarched by context, which can also change our behavior. And then finally, if all the stars are in alignment, we get the target behavior we want on the right-hand side. Now, what we can do is see how we can work with this uh, framework in a couple of areas. The first is effectiveness, and the second is building brand equity. And these are just a couple of examples. There's something like 120 principles of science that sit behind all of this. And I just want to show you a couple of examples right now. The first is attention and perception. So we can get people to look where we want them to look. And as soon as I put that image up, I know exactly where all of you looked. Whether you're men or women, it doesn't matter. Everyone looks at Brad Pitt. Now, conventional wisdom in advertising says when you lay out a print ad, you start at the top left with the headline, and then you have the offer or the brand or the payoff or whatever, bottom right. And yet you all looked at Brad Pitt first. Why? Because it's hardwired in us to attend to other human beings. There's nothing more rewarding for the brain than another human being. It's part of our survival instinct. Is that person going to kill me, or could I mate with that person? I mean, it's quite primitive, this stuff, but there are parts of the brain that are <laughs> devoted and have developed over millions of years. Hey, look, we are victims of our own evolution, OK? Millions of years. There's an area called the fusiform gyrus that is devoted to facial recognition and decoding facial expression. It's very important to us to ascertain whether that person approaching us is, is friend or foe. So we look at the face. Now, that's hardwired. So we can work with this. We can get people to look where we want them to look. And if I showed you this image now and said, what jumps out? The Q. Thank you. The Q jumps out from a, for the reasons of another principle of what's called stopping power. Our attention is drawn automatically to things that contrast contrast in colour, shape and size. And the Q contrasts against its surroundings. Now, this is so well known in visual neuroscience that it's possible to actually write an algorithm to replicate this process, to deconstruct an image and then based on the saliency of points, colour, luminance, contrast, etc., we can get a piece of software to predict where you look. And this is exactly it. This is a tool that we use, we use with a lot of clients to help design and optimise print layouts in particular, to say, where do I want people to look? And what, what's the stopping power? What are the hot spots of attention? We used this with one of our clients, BT. Now, they had this piece of direct mail that was not working for them. It wasn't getting the response rates they wanted. And when we used the tool, we were able to ascertain why. And the key reason was that face. Bottom right, with attention is drawn to the face. The problem was it sucks the attention away from the call to action, which is on the right-hand side of the page where the offer is. So our, our uh, advice to BT was very simple. In the short term, take the face off. And this is what the tool predicts will happen. Now the face is gone, those contrasting elements are the stopping power. They're the hotspots. That's where the offer is. Did it work? They tried this in A-B testing. Their response rates went up nearly 32%. Now, hands up if you'd like a response rate increase of 32%. <laughs> OK, rhetorical question. You know, when, like BT, you're sending out millions of mailings, that is not a trivial increase in response rate. So we can take the principles of science and leverage them to our advantage to get people to look where we want them to look. Now, I'm going to talk about goals, which is the other end of the framework. And I'm going to start with another quotation here. This is from the social anthropologist, Roy Dondrad. Uh, and what Roy said is, uh, is the following. To... To understand people, one needs to understand what leads them to act as they do. And to understand what leads them to act as they do, one needs to know their goals. Now, we're going to look at goals because this is absolutely fundamental to behaviour change. Goals lie behind a lot of the constructs and paradigms in the commercial sector. When I was a brand manager, I used to, used to measure attitudes. I used to measure 
things like brand love or, or meaningful brand or whatever. But what I've come to realise is that those are all outcomes of getting goal achievement. Let me illustrate that. We had a client who said, our key metric is brand I love. And we looked at their metrics and we looked at their competitors and guess what? All the users of all of those brands said strongly, I love that brand. The key point was, why do they love their brand? Not whether they feel warm about it, why do they feel warm about it? Why do they feel attachment? Why do they choose that brand? And goals lie behind this. So, sorry, let's look at the goals that people might have. So here again, we turn to science. We look at evolutionary and social psychology, overlaid with neuroscience, because all this is regulated by hormones and neurotransmitters. And science has determined a set and, and defined a set of goals that drive human beings. And this is universal. This is the joy of it. It works across demographies, across cultures, and across categories as well. There are three primary drivers of the, of the human race. Security, autonomy, and excitement. Now, autonomy is about who's the leader of the pack. This is about superiority, success, recognition, status, esteem, and power. Security, on the other hand, is about warmth, tradition, closeness, care for self, care for others, sociability. And excitement is the novelty-seeking system in the brain. This is, what, this is about going hunting and, and seeking out new uh, sensations and experiences. It's about um, zest for life and experimentation. Those are the three primary drivers. Now, we have developed a model that replicates that, but also adds in hybrids between the two, because behaviour is obviously a continuum. So if I'm climbing a mountain, for example, I meet goals that are in a field we call adventure, which is about courage and risk-taking. And they're a blend of autonomy, success and recognition. I've done it, and excitement, of course, because it's exciting to climb a mountain. Now, the interesting and very elegant and simple transition from all of this science into the commercial world is that we have come to learn that certain brands are associated with goal achievement. So whilst millions of years ago guys would have fought with clubs and hit each other to determine who was the leader of the pack, nowadays we do exactly the same, but we do it symbolically. We do it through the clothes we wear and the cars we drive and the watches we wear. So we have come to learn through uh, many years of communications and experience that brands help us to achieve these goals. Now, if we think about this sector, of course we can apply the same model to it. And I just did this off the top of my head. Now, it's easy to, to look at this intuitively, but I'll also show you how you can do it objectively. So if we looked at the rewards of charitable giving, there will be some within the autonomy sector. Certainly, for some people, it is about recognition. It is about peer group status. It is about the founder's foundation stone and, and recognition you know, service for services to charity. So there will be goals for some people in that area. There will be goals for other people in the security area, which is about care, caring for other people. It's about belonging to a community. And there'll also be goals in the enjoyment sector, which will be about the psychological relief that I feel the, the, the dissonance that might be created through seeing perhaps a disturbing image or learning about something that's going on that makes me feel psychologically ill at ease and I can assuage that feeling by acting, by donating money or by donating my, my time. So there's a comfort and a relief involved. So just intuitively you can work with this model but perhaps more importantly you can measure this. You can... There are techniques now that we use that access and measure the autopilot system. Because as we've seen with all of these examples, the vast majority of this stuff is non-conscious. <coughs> Therefore, we can't ask people direct, explicit questions. Because we just, as human beings, we simply lack the introspective access to it. And even if we do access it, sometimes we're unwilling to report it. Because we won't talk about things because it might not be politically correct, or whatever. So we can access a system that bypasses all of that and taps straight into the autopilot. And what the benefit that gives you is it's now data-based. It's now objective. So I'm sure 
like I did in the commercial sector, you have quite lengthy debates in your organisations about, well, I think this, well, I think that. And I like this, well, I don't, I quite like that. And in the end, how's the decision taken? Probably by the most senior person, but you've spent hours and hours in this debate, and here's a way to cut through that, because now you've got data, and it's come straight out of the brain. This is a really powerful way to understand your brand in comparison to the sector, your competitors, if, if appropriate. You can also use exactly this technique to measure the impact of your activities. So communications, sponsorship, for example. You can see what, what is that triggering within the autopilot. So it's a powerful way to leverage the science. Now, if, if I've whet your appetite for this whole area and it has just been a whistle-stop tour, a couple of things I would point you towards. The first is a shameless plug for my own book, Decoded, The Science Behind Why We Buy. The second, I'll invite you to um, sign up on our website, decodemarketing.co.uk, for uh, a regular science update. So every quarter, we take a topic of interest to the commercial world, we look at it through the lens of science and then report it back in layman's terms. And believe me, although my colleagues are PhDs and professors, if I can understand this stuff, then anybody can. <coughs> so it's in layman's terms. Uh, the one we're about to publish is about the difference between liking and wanting, a very key distinction in everything that we're doing. So I'd invite you to, to sign up for that. We don't spam you, we only use it for that, for that purpose. So it's been um, a pleasure addressing you this morning. I hope that's been of interest to you and, uh, and that you've enjoyed a little foray into decision science. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me here. It's my first time in this room. I was told about this room before, but it's my first time standing here. So I'll just take one minute to breathe so I don't get too nervous. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about risk and philanthropy. And you heard from Phil about how we think and feel as human beings in general. This project takes a very, very, very narrow look at how that fast and slow system works in how people take risks in philanthropy. And in particular, we're going to look at the barriers that people need to go through in order to take risks in philanthropy. So this project started when the Rockefeller Foundation and the Resource Alliance come together and ask the question, what are the biggest challenge that philanthropy will face in the next um, century? And one of the problems that philanthropy will face is that philanthropists don't take enough risks in situations where they really should. In fact, in North America, what they also found is that philanthropists don't even take as much risk in their philanthropy as their business investment. So what motivates the research is this gap between philanthropists don't take risks when they should take risks. So we try to study how can we help bridge that gap. In order to do this, we interviewed 22 international development philanthropists. And these are people from around the world, um, Europe, Asia, America. Um, and these are people from almost all backgrounds, including inherited um, wealth, self-earned wealth, male, female, generations of philanthropists in family traditions, first-generation philanthropists. Philanthropists who would like to help their own country do philanthropy in their own country and philanthropists doing um, uh, projects in other countries. 
And these people, when they come to our research, we ask them to relive an experience where they take higher than normal risks. All right, so in effect, they have to think of a very, very particular example where they have personally taken a higher than normal risk. And we say, during our study, could you please relieve the pain where you had to live through that risk decision that you took? And for a whole hour, we lived through those experiences with them, and we stopped them every single step of the way when they make risky decisions. And we say, exactly what did you think? And exactly how did you feel? Every single step. So in a way, they suffered for our research, for the purpose of learning. And the kind of projects that they told us about are the first of its kind, usually, in a given country. So it's like the first death management campaign in a country, the first children's hospice in a country, the first community foundation in a country, the first orphans higher education projects in a country, the first retail workers association in a country. So these are the risky decisions that they decided to discuss with us. So it's the first of its kind philanthropy in a given country. And it's very important that we put our minds within that kind of context, so then you know what the learning can apply to and where it can't. It is genuinely innovative in a particular country. All right? And then what we found is that they have to overcome five barriers in order to make that kind of innovation ha happen. And Roger told me that if by the end of the presentation you can't remember what the five steps are, you don't get lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing that you want to remember about these five steps is that when they happen in real life, they don't happen in a simple, clean, a linear way. That is not how it happens. All right, they're not five steps. Sometimes it happens in a circle. Always it happens repeatedly. So they have to go through the whole circle, part of the circle, some steps again, and again, and again, and again. It always happens. It always happens repeatedly during that process. And usually, they don't enter into the process from step one. They usually enter the process from there. And no, no need to read. You get dizzy. It will stop. But just so that you can remember now, that's where people enter. All right? They first enter into that project thinking, I've had my life, and now I want to do this project for these people, and I know exactly what my life has to offer. And when they enter it like that, they take their first step at defining what the risk is and assess the degree of risks. All right? And when they do that, when they do the first definition and when they do the first assessment, life is still all right with them and they experience their philanthropy for a few months, sometimes for a few years, and some things worked and some things didn't, and they adjusted. Things become difficult when they are forced into a situation where they say, guess what? My original definition of risk might have been wrong. My original assessment of the degree of risk might have been wrong. It's when that light bulb moment happened that they recognize, guess what? They have to change now. And that's when they have to cope with the negative emotion. 
that they could have been wrong. And that changed the color of their philanthropy, and it turned their philanthropy up, and it turned their philanthropy down. And it happens very slowly. And just when they think it stopped, they start all over again, and they have to cope. And it's very slow. And every time when they recognize they have to change their definitions, it happens all over again and upside down. To the point where they have to rethink, what is my life about? What is my philanthropy about? What do I have to offer to my philanthropy? What does my life mean in my philanthropy? And then they think, maybe in my life is not as I thought it was. Maybe I shouldn't have defined risks in my way of thinking and in my life. And that's when it really hurts. And they have to hope, cope with the negative emotion. So this is already not as clean as the five steps. But when you actually see the transcript, you will look more like this. And you will feel more like this. So what do fundraisers do? Well, the first recommendation that I would make is we be patient in understanding our philanthropists. Because there's no definition of risk when people go through that kind of innovation that is not personal. Every definition of risk means something about people's lives. Every time when people change that definition, it means something about their lives. So if we're patient in understanding what that risk really means to them, then we might be a little patient. Here is an example. So this is when one philanthropist tried to define what is the kind of impact that she wants to make on the orphans in a Eastern European country. These orphans usually don't attend higher education in the same rate as their peers. And as a result, they experience all the negative consequences that life can bring to them without a higher education. So she, said, she thought, OK, I'll set up a scholarship fund so I can support these people to go to college and get an education and turn their lives around. And that's the distance she wants her philanthropy to travel for these people. Right? That's the first definition of risk. And she's willing to take a degree of risk in setting up that project. And then a few months, a couple of years into the process, she realized, guess what? That's not what some of these orphans want. What they need is they want to become hairdressers. They want to become skill workers. They want to earn a living as early as they can so they can stay off street, stay off violent, be financially independent. That's what they want. So the philanthropist thought, OK, what this means is simply that I shouldn't have set up a one-track scholarship program. I should have set up a two-track philanthropic project. One track take them to college. One track take them to hairdressers. So as long as I can help them achieve that, then I can meet their goals. What is the personal bit about it for the philanthropist, though? 
is that she has to take the reality that some orphans don't want to go as high as her dreams. She has to cut her dream to half and to say, only half of these people want my dream. The other half want their own dreams. And that is OK. And if we are patient enough to listen to them and to let them learn and let them adapt in this genuinely innovative situation, then by us understanding where they're, where they're coming from, we might be able to speed up their learning faster for them. Now, what is a very interesting thing is we slow down in our understanding. We slow down in our own questioning process. So we have their learning go faster. And sometimes that might not be enough. We might also need to be patient in empathizing with them. We might also need to recognize when it really hurts. And here is when, where it really hurts. If there is this group of orphans who absolutely love the smell of the barbershop, every time they go into that barbershop, do the hair, they get their energy back, and they love making a difference in how beautiful people look every single day, that doesn't hurt the philanthropist. Actually, that pleases them greatly. They've given those people the dreams that they had, that they couldn't have had without their scholarship program. And that is fine. That's adaptation. When it really hurts, and this really hurts, is when those absolutely brilliant people who loves to read, who gets every second of their college lives, the minute they set their foot on a college campus, who can just spend their lives in the library and be happy, and who would want to do the kind of research that they really can find their lives in if they just can go to college. They choose not to because they would rather become a hairdresser so their little brother and their little sisters can stay off street. And that hurts like hell to them. And you can see their, you can hear their suffering even when they're on Skype with you during the interview, when we force them to relive those moments. Slow down here. Tell me exactly what hurt you. Tell me that one child that hurt you to your core. That's when it really hurts. It's come face to face with that reality that they can't save them. Now for fundraisers, if we're patient in our knowing, in our understanding, in their learning, and if we take our time to really feel how they feel, what can we do slightly differently? Well, we can stop asking easy questions. <coughs> Why didn't they do more research before they enter into the process? Why couldn't they learn faster? How did they feel this way? Well, it's their own fault that they felt this way. If they had only done more research, they didn't have to suffer. Well, this is an innovative situation where nobody could have learned any faster. So the easy answer to those easy questions is they did. And in this second case, it's a philanthropist who wants to set up the first retail workers social benefit association in a country. 
He designed his whole life for his philanthropy. The first stage of his life is he wants to learn. The second stage of his life is he wants to lead, so he collects the money he needs. And the third step is simply to return to them. And he did by the book every single step of what he should have done before he entered philanthropy. Two years after he started his project, what happened? He realized that no wealth, no system, no accessible human potentials is enough to make the impact that he wants to make to that particular beneficiaries sustainable forever. And that hurts like hell. That's his own dream shattered. What does that mean to his life? And that is when philanthropy gets really lonely. Because only he can answer that question. Only he knew exactly what happened. Of all the people surrounding him, nobody can really understand what he went through. Nobody can really feel how he felt. And again, you can hear how he felt on Skype when you talk to him. The despair in his voice. So that's the next message for fundraisers. How can I be patient in knowing? How can I be patient in empathizing? And those are hard questions. What this research showed was that in order to be more patient in our knowing, you can ask five questions. And I hope by now you can all remember what they are. And this research also showed how you could empathize with them. Because what it told you is that those pivotal redefinition moments are the moments that could really hurt. So if we really allow ourselves to feel how they feel, then we have a better chance to accompany them well in their lonely journey. The final message is answering these hard questions will be hard. It is not easy to allow ourselves to really feel how they feel because it hurts us. This project does not address that question. This project simply said, if you do those five things, you can become patient. You can become patient in understanding and in empathizing. One of our PhD students will spend the next five years of her life answering this question. What are the barriers that fundraisers and philanthropists will overcome together in order to accompany each other in that journey? So for now, the only thing I can offer you is my personal experience, and this is not research-based, so please do not tweet. <laughs> It is in this project that I've seen the most beautiful human lives doing the very best they can. So for me, it is worth asking those hard questions. Thank you very much, Gosh. I'm so glad it's over.
I'd like to introduce you to um, this gentleman, first of all. Um, in some ways, it would have been even better if you'd had him here speaking today, because um, so much of the story I'm going to tell you today is down to him. Now, this is Antonio Guterres, who is the High Commissioner for UNHCR. UNHCR actually stands for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It's actually all about him and about the office he holds and the role he play, holds in the world, which is basically to safeguard the rights of all refugees and displaced people in the world, of whom there are now more than 50 million people. So the High Commissioner has been at UNHCR since 2005, this High Commissioner. He used to be the Prime Minister of Portugal. Um, he's a great man. You're going to hear a lot more about him as I go through this presentation. Um, when he got to UNHCR um, in 2005... I think the income, the annual income from private sector fundraising was less than $10 million a year, globally. Uh, to put that in some context, this is an organisation that at this point had an annual budget of $1.5 billion. So $1.5 billion, um, serving at that point about 30 million people, about 8,000 staff working in 150 countries, and they were getting less than $10 million a year from private sector fundraising. Um, so um, the High Commissioner made a decision that one of the things he was going to do in his tenure was to do something about this. Um, and he hired a number of staff, um, some excellent colleagues who I'll mention in a minute, and then in 2009 I came along. Um, and this is what he said to me when he first met me. Um, Basically, he, um, and I don't think that's because he'd heard anything about me, by the way. I think that was, that was more of a, a philosophical statement rather than a personal one. Um, but basically, uh, the High Commissioner knew that something needed to be done about private sector fundraising. Um, he was determined to give it a big effort, but he was very, very pessimistic about what could be achieved. Um, and there were some really good reasons for him to be pessimistic. Um, we had um, an enormous funding gap. Um, the gap in 2015 is about $3 billion. So our needs-based budget in 2015 is over $6 billion for reasons I'm sure you can all imagine. Um, so even at that point, he was facing an enormous funding gap, a schism between the needs that the organisation needed to meet and the funds that were available. But UNHCR is an extremely conservative organisation. Um, and there are good reasons for that. They have to be exceptionally careful about how they talk to the world and how they message to the world. So just to give you one example, when the Syria crisis started many years ago and some of us were jumping up and down saying, we need to go out there, we need to be start talking to the public, we need to start mobilising people, it was pointed out to us that at the beginning of the Syria crisis, we had over 250,000 Iraqi refugees living inside Syria and about 80 staff who work for UNHCR looking after them. So what the High Commissioner was having to balance at that point was anything that we said about Syria, anything at all, would it put the lives and welfare of those 250,000 people at risk? So anything that smacks of boldness, um, of selling the cause of, of um, direct, authentic speech to the public has a whole layer of risk for UNHCR it doesn't have for many other organisations. Um, also, UNHCR hates change. Um, it's, it's an intensely bureaucratic, bureaucratic organisation. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked in the UN, um, but it's impossible for me to convey in 30 minutes the, the sheer horror of the bureaucracy. Um, layers and layers and layers of rules and processes and systems to go through even to buy a computer or hire a staff member. It's, it's absolutely crushing and it makes it very, very difficult to innovate or implement change into the organisation. Also, there was an incredibly pessimistic atmosphere within UNHCR about the public's attitude towards refugees. Now, remember, most of the people I work with in UNHCR spend their lives defending people 
from xenophobia, from war, from genocide, from racist attacks, from governments that are issuing unpleasant and toxic messages about refugees. They live in an environment where they think the world hates refugees and don't support their rights. Um, so they, they had no confidence that if we actually spoke to the public about refugees that people would want to support that. So what does that mean for me and the colleagues in private sector fundraising who had taken on this task? Um, well, one of the things I was very pleased to find out very quickly, but I guess we all know this anyway, that actually the refugee cause is one of the most compelling in the world. And global Mori research consistently for the last 20 years has placed the refugee issue as one of the top three global issues that people in 150 countries around the world are most sympathetic to. Um, if you'd like to know what the others are, children, obviously, and famine is the other one. So children, famine, and refugees are the top three causes that people around the world say they're most sympathetic to. So I knew anyway, but I was able to prove to the organisation that people are interested. We had some exceptional fundraising colleagues, and I really want to emphasise that the story I'm going to tell you today is a relay race. Um, there have been some excellent colleagues who've come before me in, in very difficult circumstances and try to prove the case for private sector fundraising. So there's a colleague called Pierre Bernard, who, Pierre Bernard Labar, who was with UNICEF before, who did my job a number of years ago. Julie Weston, who I know a lot of you know. Um, uh, Claire Rogers, who's now with Save the Children. You know, a number of people who work very, very hard to try and get this, this moving forward. And when I joined, there was also a very small group of colleagues who were just as committed as I am to making this work. I've already mentioned the High Commissioner. We also had an exceptional Deputy High Commissioner. We always have an American Deputy High Commissioner in UNHCR. So the one that I had when I first started there was the ex-CEO of Boeing, um, an ex-Secretary, um, Assistant Secretary of State in the United States. He was fantastic. He understood that we needed to invest, that we needed to market, that we needed to go out and talk to the public. And we now have another Deputy High Commissioner who's been equally supportive. But ultimately, it's the breathtaking need. Um, I've never worked for an organisation before where the need was just so absolutely stupefyingly enormous. Um, as I said, we've now got a $3 billion funding gap. And what does that funding gap mean? It literally means, literally means people without roofs over their head, people dying in war situations. It means tens of millions of children not getting access to any access to education. Um, and it means 50 million people who um, really have not much hope of a productive future if we can't get more resources to them. So what that means is you know you've got to make this work. So me and my very small team of colleagues, we decided that we would try and embrace the challenge. Um, it, was, it was probably quite a foolish thing to try and take on, and we certainly had lots of moments we didn't know if we could make this work, but we decided to try. So we started with proving the business case. We started with saying, we have to prove to UNHCR that private sector fundraising will work. Why would they invest in us? Why would they grow the program? Why would they support us in all the way we need if we can't actually prove to them that this is viable for the organisation and for the cause? So we put an enormous amount of focus on data analysis, really exceptional data analysis and recording and evidencing that when we invested in a particular program, we carried out certain activities, we would get this end result. Um, we also only worked on areas of fundraising where we knew we would get results. For the first two years, I'm not ashamed to say we didn't take any risks. We didn't innovate. No innovation, no interesting projects, no wild and wacky new ideas. It was all absolutely in what markets can we deliver really solid, predictable fundraising where if we put in half a million dollars, we know what we'll get back out at the end so we can take those graphs and spreadsheets up to um, the High Commissioner's Office and prove that this works. Um, we recruited some, some more colleagues. We needed more expertise. And we gradually, over the first two years, just, just built trust. Um, the first two years I was at UNHCR, I didn't get an annual budget. 
I'd, I'd go to the High Commissioner, I'd say, High Commissioner, we want $15 million this year to spend on fundraising. And he'd say, Amanda, you've got three. Come back in two months and tell me what you've done with it. <laughs> and I would get pockets of money handled out, handled out in little parcels as we went through the years. And he made me come back every two or three months and say, how are we doing? Show him the spreadsheets, show him the graphs. <laughs> and he would then allow another little tranche of money out and another little tranche of money out. We don't work like that anymore, thank goodness. But it was the right thing to do. So we went from having an annual investment budget of around $6 million in um, 2009. And um, the annual investment budget we have in 2014 is $97 million. And next year, it will be $120 million. Um, and I'm just going to say here, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm just saying, I'll just make the point here that I'm actually not telling you anything that if you work really hard you couldn't find on the internet because these figures are all within um, the, the minuted documents of UNHCR. So if any of you want to find out if I'm telling the truth as well and you're, you're brave enough to read lots of UN minutes, it is all buried in there. So I'm not sharing any, any secrets. So we gradually worked our way up to, to winning that investment budget. And I guess... That's one of the things I really want to share with you. I didn't walk into an organization that wanted to spend that amount of money on fundraising. Um, but we were able, by taking a very respectful approach to the um, concerns of the organization, to gradually build up that level of trust. So I wanted to put in a slide before I got to this one, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our current strategy is. And I was going to put a slide in before I got to here, because I realized when I was looking at this presentation that I'm starting off by telling you about all the challenges and what we needed to do. And then it goes whoosh, straight through to the new strategy that we're pursuing for the next um, four years. And I thought, this is outrageous. This, this in no way represents the sheer, awful, crushing, uh, hard work, desperation, the tears, the, the minutes hiding in the toilets because you've just had an awful experience, the, the exhaustion that many of us have been through in the last five years, six years. Um, this is, this, I think one of the problems with doing lectures like this, although it's marvellous, is it's really easy to stand in front of you all and make it sound like something was really straightforward and easy. And I think one of the disadvantages is... If any of you are having difficult times in your organisation and dealing with big problems, it's easy to then leave the room and going, oh, she made it sound so easy. Why isn't it like that for me? It was a very, very tough road that we went down. We had many, many times when we weren't sure if this was going to work. We had many, many times where something we had thought was going to be a glorious success didn't work out. We had many, many times when we looked at our numbers and had absolute panic that we weren't going to achieve our targets by the end of the year. Because we knew if we had one year where we didn't meet our annual targets, all those uh, cynics in the organization who didn't think we should be doing private sector fundraising would at that moment be going, you see, we said this wouldn't work. So lots and lots of blood, sweat, and tears. I'm just going to talk you through now um, the strategy that we've put in place for the next four years. So I've painted this picture of the change that we brought in. We've won the trust of the organization, um, and we've done that by not in innovating very much, by not taking many risks. In many ways, our fundraising program is, is quite dull to look at because it's very predictable. It's face-to-face -face fundraising. It's some digital. It's some TV. It's some corporate fundraising, some foundations, and some major donors. It's, you know, the, it wouldn't win any prizes at any innovation contest. Um, so we've done that, and we've built the program but we're now ready to, to take some risks, to be a bit bolder, to be a bit more audacious. I'm not expecting... I don't know if that's readable. Um, it is actually quite readable, isn't it? Um, I was insistent when we set a new strategy that we should be able to put it on one piece of paper, so we had to put lots of writing into a very small piece of paper. Um, but I'll just talk you through very quickly um, what our new strategy is, and then, and then I'll share some figure, more detailed figures with you. You'll notice at the top that we're saying our vision is to achieve $1 billion at some point in the future. And we haven't put a date next to that, because that's not the reason that figure is in there. The reason that figure is in there 
is we're making a point to the organisation. And the point we're making to the organisation is that we think we've arrived, that we've found our place in the organisation, and we're a serious player in terms of mobilising, mobilising resources. If that one billion figure had been mentioned in any meeting five years ago, people would laugh themselves off their chairs. But what's very pleasing is, is when we shared this strategy across the organisation, no one's laughing anymore, which is very pleasing. Um, and we're going to raise that billion, $1 billion at some point in the future. Um, I'm just going to check my figures here. By, yes, having 10 million supporters in 100 countries. Um, so why 10 million supporters in 100 countries? Because in some ways, from a fundraising perspective, we could probably reach a $1 billion in 10, 12, 14 countries. We'll probably get 90% of our income from about 14 countries. Um, the reason we're doing that is because we're really emphasising that we're part of a global movement of support for UNHCR, that we're not just there to raise money. We believe we can reach people in nearly every country in the world and elicit their sympathy, and we have a plan about how we're going to do that. Um, and you'll also see that we're emphasising um, funding transformational change and solutions. So we're saying... We don't think we're in the business of just raising cash for the organisation anymore. Over the coming years, we want to be much more central to identifying transformational challenges, transformational opportunities. For example, how do we help whole refugee communities to go home? Um, and bringing the private sector more into play with that. So we've got some targets for 2018, and our targets for 2018... Uh, this is a bit of a memory test for me because um, I'm, I'm not going to turn around. Uh, we're going to raise $500 million by 2018, and we're going to do that by having 5 million supporters in our books. We've just reached a million supporters, so that gives you a sense of how much work we have to do. Um, and we're going to do that in 50 countries. I know, the, I know the numbers sound very pat, and they are very pat. We, um, we haven't actually got a list of what those 50 countries are. But we're basically saying we're going to be halfway to our transformational vision by 2018. Um, and as you'll all not also notice on the purpose, we're saying, again, we're not just there to raise money, but we're there to actually create a community of support who will raise their voices for refugees. Um, the bit I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about now is about the um, boosters. We've, we've come up with this idea of boosters. So we've come up with this idea that if we just followed business as usual, we'd probably get to about $400 million by 2018. So business as usual, we keep running the programmes we're running, we keep investing, we keep doing good fundraising. We thought we'd get to about $400 million. So we've come up with the concept of, are there four or five different areas of work that if we become best of class in those four or five areas of work, that um, that would... Um, transform, deliver a transformational energy to the amount of impact we're able to achieve. And we said, yes, there is a, the, that we could identify five of those. And the reason we've picked the five that we've picked is every single one of them cuts across every single aspect of our fundraising. Um, and that was quite important to us. I'm sure lots of you in the room run fundraising programmes or work in fundraising programmes where your teams and colleagues are divided into silos. I'm sure lots of you work where you've got a marketing team and a major donor team, or maybe an individual giving team and a leadership giving team. And obviously, it's important to recognise those different skill sets. But, but we see enormous opportunity in introducing much more integrated approaches. I mean, we've all identified this to our work. Each of these boosters equally applies to every single aspect of our fundraising. So if you just take emergency fundraising, we're saying emergency fundraising is not just for the marketing department. Emergency fundraising is for our corporate fundraisers, it's for our foundations team, it's for our major donors, um, it's for our branding, it's for our digital team to take on. We're saying emergency fundraising has to be an area of work that every single person who works for the department has to embrace and take on and make it their job to serve. And the same with the other four, five boosters. So one of them is thematic campaigns, um, one of them is donor loyalty, one of them is voices for refugees, which is, which is that whole area of mobilising people's voices to... Um, advocate and support refugee issues. And then the most important one, the one that runs across all of that, is digital first. Now, digital first for us is not 
just that we're going to build a great digital marketing team, although obviously that's part of that. We're saying that we want to become an absolutely digitally embedded team where every single aspect of our work, everything we do, um, our communications, um, how we plan, how we share information with each other, how we train our colleagues, how we work with our corporate partners, how we communicate with foundations, how we deliver reports from the field. We're saying the first thing anybody in the team has to ask is how can digital help me do this? What's the digital way of doing this? What's the digital approach? What's the new technology that will help us to achieve this? So we're saying that that thread of digital is the most important one that runs all the way across the strategy. I'll just talk to you a little bit about the countries we're fundraising in, in case you're interested. So um, we don't have a very successful program yet in the United States, but we've just had um, a fantastic appointment in the United States. So our new chief executive of our US um, part, fundraising partner is Anne-Marie Gray, who some of you all know. So I know she's going to absolutely transform what we do in the United States. Um, and we're saying that seven other countries are going to be where we see the majority of our growth. And you, I won't read them out for you, but you can see what they are. Um, I'll just mention the Gulf very briefly because a lot of organisations are trying to achieve impact in the Gulf at the moment. Obviously, an enormous amount of money there, but a very complex um, operating environment. And we are finding that we're ma managing to make very good inroads there. I'll show you some data in a minute to support that. Um, you'll notice that the UK is on that list, but we've got it down as an emerging market, which will probably make some of you laugh. Um, we don't actually see the UK as one of our most significant markets. Um, and the reason for that is it's one of the most expensive and difficult markets, as many of you know, to actually achieve headway in. Um, and if you're working on a global stage and you're making a decision about whether to fundraise in the UK, where the cost of fundraising is so high, where the environment is so competitive, or you could take $3 million and invest it in the Philippines, where you might get three times as much return for the same investment, you have the liberty of choosing markets where you think you can make more impact. We will fundraise in the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom still holds a very special place on the world stage from a political perspective as a leading influencer. So it's important that we have a presence here, but we don't anticipate that we'll be raising enormous amounts of money here. Um, and then you can see what all the other countries are. It's not an enormous list. Um, if you recall, I said that we were going to be um, recruiting supporters in 100 countries when we achieve our vision goal. And the reason for that is we're going to also adopt a pure digital approach. And we've done some testing on this. And we're going to be reaching out into a very, very high number of markets without any staff or operating structure in country and just using pure digital methods to do that. It's, it's remarkably successful. Um, and of course, because the overheads are so very, very low, um, you, you don't have to achieve so much in order to deliver a program that's very, very successful. So this is just... Um, our little fun diagram of what we think the five global boosters are going to do for us. Um, and we've put um, financial estimates against them for, for the value we think they'll bring in. Again, I want to emphasize there isn't an enormous amount of data analysis behind this. Um, we do have lots and lots of data analysis, but I'm not going to stand here and argue that, for example, donor loyalty is definitely worth $50 million if we get better at it. Um, what we're trying to do here is partly setting um, a scale of ambition for our global team and for the organization. I'm absolutely confident we will achieve the $500 million, but exactly what that pattern looks like by the time we get to 2018, I don't know. And to be honest, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> we're setting an agenda. We'll work towards it. I'm confident that some of these boosters will be an amazing success, and I'm pretty confident one or two of them won't be. Um, but we'll work that out as we go along. So I just want to talk a little bit about culture because changing culture has been one of the most difficult and challenging things that we've had to deal with. Uh, I've painted a picture of, of what we walked into. Um, 
So I talked a little bit about the UNHCR culture, but of course cultures don't operate, operate in silos. You, you can't be a team within an organisation and not soak up um, lots of the values of the organisation. Often, of course, that's a very, very good thing, and there are many very, very good things about the culture of UNHCR that we're very proud to embrace. Values around commitment, sacrifice, being a humanitarian. There are many values about UNHCR which are are marvellous, but there are also the values around don't take risks, don't stick your neck out or it might damage your career, um, make sure that you follow the right policies and the right planning mechanisms, and if you do that, even if what you're doing doesn't work out, that'll be fine because you'll be able to point out that you followed the right processes. It's, it's very much a process-orientated culture rather than an outcome-orientated culture. Um, one of the things that I've noticed that's really interesting is we bring in new fundraisers and new colleagues into the team. It actually doesn't take very long, three or four months, before you notice that people are starting to become a little bit more cautious. Um, it, so it, it, it really does have an effect. It has it's had an effect on me. I've, I've noticed myself sort of starting to absorb that sense of cautiousness and having to sort of look out for it, like, like watching out for when you're catching a cold, um, and, and resist the pressure to think in that way. So we've actually created a new value deck for the team. So we've worked very hard on setting some values, which are all around embracing risk, being courageous, supporting each other. Um, and we're going to be spending the whole of next year doing global training with all the teams around the world and saying, these are our values now. And if you follow these values, you will be supported, you will be rewarded. We will celebrate what you're achieving. And, and um, really, really encouraging people to think differently. We're also having to build a much stronger management system. Um, I'm going to show you the graph in a minute that makes it clear the amount of growth that we've delivered, which is very exciting, and obviously we're very proud of it, but it does have enormous risks. Um, and one of the risks is you don't actually build the infrastructure quickly enough. So you can actually be building your fundraising program and realising that your reporting cycle or your financial reporting just can't keep up. So we need to work more on that. We're going to work more on, on, on talent, and we need to get, do a much better job at working with internal stakeholders. There are still lots of people in the organisation who don't really understand or value what we're doing. So I'm just going to show you very quickly some slides that show you a bit of a picture of the journey we've been on. So this is our supporters and donors. The red is um, regular giving. This is where we're getting our income in terms of um, the regions over the years. You can see um, that Europe is, is the dominant funding source, but also the orange Asia. Asia is exploding at the moment for so many organisations, um, and it's where we're leading in terms of our individual giving. Um, this slide is, is, won't mean anything until I explain what's happening here. One of the uh, things that we've done with the new strategy is actually set new funding parameters to take programs that we're heading in one particular direction and point them in another. So, for example, one of the parameters we set for next year is that $25 million was set aside for digital innovation. So we've got a budget of $120 million next year, and we decided that $25 million minimum had to go on digital innovation. And I said to the global team when we were planning, if we don't get that many applications, that's fine the money will just sit in my desk until someone asks for it, but it's not going on anything else. So you can see there that the spending on face-to-face -face is levelling out. It's going down slightly, which is what we wanted, and you can see that the spending on digital is going up in our digital. So that's a huge... That one slide tells you about a lot of change that's happening within the department, and that's the slide that tells you that the growth we've been through. So in 2007, we were at 25 million... Um, this year we'll end at about 2.30, maybe at 2.50 if we're lucky. So that's, I think my maths are not great, 1,000%, 1,000% in six years. Um, and we are the fastest growing international PSFR program, and I know because I'm part of a group that, that analyzes all of this. So our, our compound annual growth rate for um, the past four years was 38%. I'll just pause on that. It makes me feel very tired when I look at that slide. But... <laughs> and I'm really quickly just going to take you through this because this is what it's all about. Over the last 10 years, 
We've delivered $1 billion, and this is some of the things that we've done to make a difference. So we've helped 15 million people in emergencies. Um, we've helped educate about 5 million children. Uh, 400,000 mosquito nets. This is all private money. And 6 million people on the receiving end of our cash voucher programs. I'm Salla Saarinen from Finland. Hyvää iltapäivää kaikille, myös suomalaisille, jotka olette täällä tänään. Uh, English is my second language, as you may notice. English is very hard for me because usually I speak Finnish. It's quite common in Finland. It's a very different kind of language, because English has all these silent letters. You know the letters that you write down, but never say. In Finnish, we don't have these. I have a secret for you. They are unnecessary. <laughs> so you can just stop writing them. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if numbers were silent as well. I think they would be much more useful. Like, I owe you 75 pounds, but the seven is silent, so here's your five. <laughs> this joke was from Ismo Leikola's stand-up show. He's a Finnish comedian who just won the funniest person in the world competition in Las Vegas. Yes, I know, I know. A fin, funniest, really? Give me a break. How is that possible? When we Finns are famous for not showing our feelings as shown here. Fur furious delight, delight. Endless laugh. And so on. Whenever you come to Finland, whenever, or think about starting a business, like setting up a new charity organization, you might want to consider the cultural differences. The differences between the negotiation styles. When you look at the English style of negotiation, you notice that there are more than 10 steps to get to an agreement. But with Finns, <clears throat> it is a much easier. Minimal speech. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Miscomprehension. Da. What? And then summary. Okay. Let's do it. That's why we are so effective. <laughs> <laughs> we Finns, we love our summer cottages in the middle of nowhere with no annoying neighbors. There are places where we can be by ourselves in silence. But we are not alone. There are a lot of mosquitoes buzzing around which breaks that silence. Is it the sting, the blood-sucking part, or is it the sound that bothers us? The sound that destroys the silence. Mm. 
the end of that mosquito. We found racers. We are like mosquitoes. <laughs> we might be small, but we make a lot of noise. We challenge our organizations to take a step out of their comfort zone. We want our, challenge, our charity organizations to be loud and to not enjoy the silence where no one will notice you. We mosquitoes do not want to give our lives to the cause of humanity. But we want to give the rest of our lives. If you want to give the rest of your life, which kind of culture do you want to work and live? Each workplace has its has its own ways of doing things. They form the workplace culture. The signs of a good workplace and good workplace culture can be di divided into three groups. Trust, pride, and communality. Trust, pride, and communality. Trust is made up of credibility, fairness, and mutual respect. When we feel that we can believe in what happens in our workplace, our operations are credible, forthright, and awe-inspiring. We feel pride in our work, and our work gains greater meaning. We are all social back animals. We want to fit in. We don't want to be alone, buzzing like mosquitoes in the corner, sucking the lifeblood from our co-workers. We want to be respected. We want to be valued. Regardless of where we live, regardless where we work. What our culture is like, or what kind of buzzing creators we are. It doesn't matter if we are fundraisers, donors, or co-partners. Co we all want to be liked just the way we are. And when we like each other, when we respect each other just the way they are, we will work in a culture where we are happy to give the rest of our lives to the cause of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Keep us.